G'day guys, Dean from Blog for the Blood God here, and on today's episode we're going to be talking about phase locked characters and phase locked units in Warhammer 40k, why I love them to death and why I think they're a fantastic thing for gameplay balance, strategic and tactical engagement with your opponent, and why I think everybody if they approach it with the right mindset will come to agree and they'll come to love them as well. So with that being said, let's just jump straight into the episode. Blog for the Blood God. G'day guys, let's talk about phase locked units in Warhammer 40k and why I think they are absolutely fantastic and they are great for the game. They're a really healthy addition to the rules. Um, so let's first define what I mean by phase locked and that's essentially any of the units in Warhammer 40k that are restricted to only being able to suffer a set number of wounds in any given phase. Uh, so these are units like Abaddon the Despoiler, there's the new Bloodthirster does it, Gazkull does it, the Phoenix Lords do it, there's a ton of units, there's the Necron Catan do it, there's a whole ton of units that are coming out now that have this new, um, new rule and it's basically just prevents them from being able to be destroyed in a single phase. Now, some people love this, some people hate it, I feel like the general um, opinion of it is that it's bad and that it ruins the game but I think those people are only looking at it on a surface level and they're not looking at the broader implications for those sorts of rules. Now the reason that I love those rules actually I'll, first I'll address some of the criticisms I think would probably be the best place to start so um, one of the things people often criticize it about is what happens if your army only does damage in a single phase so what happens if you're a tower player and you really you only do your damage in the shooting phase, right? Then all of a sudden these phase-locked types of units become a real problem for you, right? And this is very true and very valid, right? But my counter-argument to that would be you shouldn't be designing a competitive list that only does damage in one phase. That's, your, that's a mistake on your part in list design. That's not a problem with the fundamental idea of a unit that's only able to suffer damage in a single phase because a well-rounded list should be able to do damage across multiple phases. Um, and this is more for more than just for dealing with these phase lock guys, right? You want to be able to do damage in multiple phases so that you can do various things like, say you want to be able to do some damage in the movement phase and in the psychic phase so that you can dig your units out if they get tagged and then if you dig them out, now they're able to shoot in your shooting phase because you've been able to do damage in the movement and in the psychic phases. So being able to dig them out like that, or being able to do you know damage in the shooting phase so that you can then charge things that are you know protected. So if you're running an all combat army and then somebody just goes, cool, I'm just gonna string some guardsmen out in front of my, you know, my vehicles or whatever. And now you're like, oh, well now I can't charge the vehicles because there's guardsmen in the way. So you need to be able to do shooting damage so that you can clear the guardsmen so that you can then proceed to charge the vehicles. So being able to do damage across multiple phases is like a cornerstone of a competitive 40K list. So the, the challenge that people raise with phase locked where they say it penalizes armies that only do damage in a single phase, to that I just say, well, boo-hoo, get good, don't run stupid lists that only shoot. Right? So it sounds harsh, but it's true. Right? If you want, if you want to play competitively, you need to get rid of those sorts of things. Um, and then, you know, some of the other ones are some of the other criticisms are that it, it sort of breaks the narrative. You know, it's it's a disjoint from the narrative because it's like, well, hang on, I just shot, you know, Abaddon with a rail cannon that you know can pretty much solo you know most vehicles, and it only does three wounds to him. You know? But for those people, you know, that think it sort of breaks the narrative, like, oh, I just shot, you know, a billion bullets into him and it was only able to do three wounds, even though against any other character it would have done, you know, fucking 50. Or any, any of those sorts of um, complaints or, or challenges, I guess. What I would say to them is there is... If you want to open that box, there are infinite things that break the fucking narrative immersion in 40k. And this would be one of the, like, the least offensive versions of that. You know, there's tons of examples of things where it's like, 
this makes no sense, you know? How is it possible for this to happen? You know, like a Blood Angels scout sergeant with a thunder hammer is able to kill a knight. It's like, what the fuck? In a single fight phase, he just goes, boop, kills it. It's like, no, no, just no, you know? And you could argue, okay, well, oh, I'm going to use my narrative brain to argue that and say, oh, well, you know, maybe he's a, a really particularly experienced scout sergeant and he knew exactly where to hit that knight so that it would topple over and, you know, blah, 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 right? But if you can use that sort of narrative device to explain that, well, then surely you can go, well, Abaddon is blessed by the fucking chaos gods. So you know, that offers him a certain amount of protection where the Chaos Gods intervene and prevent him from being harmed. Or, you know, the same with Gazkull. He's, he's, you know, the prophet of Gork and Mork. He's fucking protected, you know. Um, so, I think if, you, if you, the narrative disjointer is not a valid criticism either. I think you can definitely explain it away with that. Um, so I think we can dispatch with most of the criticisms, I think it's just surface level, and they're people that are either salty, that they don't have access to a phase locked unit in their army, or salty because they've been hurt, they've been bad touched by a phase lock character, you know. They've gone up against somebody who's running Abaddon, they were stupid and ran a list that only does damage in one phase, and therefore they couldn't deal with Abaddon, and now they're salty about it, right? But again, I would say, well, that's their problem. That's their, their failing. That's not a failing of GW, and that's not a failing of this rule. Now, where this rule is fucking awesome, and I think most people will agree with this, is that it incentivizes strategic tactical combos of units. And that is so satisfying when it works. So a lot of 40K lists in the past have been all of your strategy has been enduring list writing. You know, you write a list, you put a whole bunch of fucking combos in the list, and by combos, I mean combinations of war gear, relic, you know, warlord traits, upgrades, those sorts of things. You put a whole bunch of them combos in, and then you also put some synergies in where you go, okay, cool, I'm going to take this psyker because he can buff that unit, and then I can make this combo work, right? And then when you get onto the table, pretty much all of your thinking is already done. You've already done all your thinking, you've planned it all out, you know what's going to happen, and then it's just going through the motions of, like, doing it, you know. And that's not particularly rewarding. It does have its elements of rewarding, you know, in the way that you've, you've come up with a plan that works, you know, that's rewarding. Um, but what's way more rewarding is when you get to the table and somebody presents you with a challenge like a phase-locked character, and you're like, okay, what I'm going to need to do in order to deal with that character so I'm going to need to move forward I'm going to need to fly over that unit and drop some bombs on it to kill the unit that's in front of it so that I can then do psychic damage and smite the character so that I can then shoot the character so that I can then charge the character and kill it right so you need to take two or three units across multiple phases to combo up and kill that thing and that that is strategy game that's a tabletop war game right there that's exactly what you should be doing that's what games workshop should be incentivizing and that's what 40k should be all about is going okay how can i use my units in like in harmony with each other or in synchronized with each other to achieve a goal it shouldn't just be okay i've got this one unit that's going to go in and like my one paladin unit that's fucking unkillable and it's just going to go into the center or the terminator unit that just goes into the center Yes, there is an element of that, and yes, 40k has historically been that, but I think that leads to a lot more feels-bad moments than a phase-locked character. You know, most of the feels-bad moments in 40k come from when you get matched up into somebody, and you can just tell from the start of the game that you can't win. No amount of strategizing or combos is going to win, because you can't kill their thing whatever their thing might be. It might be a bunch of knights, it might be a horde, it might be, you know, an elite army of really hard to kill things, like whatever it is. There's always something that's a broken combo that's really hard to deal with. And that's a combo that they've written into their list. So you, you, what you're actually saying is that my list can't deal with their list. That's so frustrating. Whereas the, if, if more things in the game were phase locked, and they could only take a set number of damage per phase, you would actually get into scenarios where 
it wouldn't really matter how tough something is, you know? Like, it doesn't matter that Abaddon has a two-up save, and it doesn't matter that he has a four-up invulnerable save, and it doesn't matter that he has all these things, because he can only take three wounds per phase anyway. So, and, and most things are going to be able to do three wounds to him, like, you know, enough bolters will do three wounds to him. So, I really like the phase lock mechanic. I like it way more than any of the other defensive mechanics, because it actually gives your opponent an opportunity to use the units in their army in a specific way on the tabletop. They have to make those decisions on the tabletop, not in list writing. They make the decisions on the tabletop, they use those units in a certain way, if they're smart and they plan it, and they plan out their movement phase, they plan out their turn, and then they can actually come up with interesting situations on the tabletop that they can solve through, like, adaptive problem solving. That's so much more satisfying than any satisfaction you'll get from coming up with a sick combo in your list. And the other thing that's really important to note is that if you come up with a really cool combo in your list, right, and then you go and win a GT with it, next minute, Goonhammer's going to do an article and everyone's going to steal it. Everybody's going to be running the same thing. They're going to be like, oh, look at fucking Manny Chima's fucking list or look at fucking, you know, Matt Marasoli's list or fucking I mean, name, name a person, right? People are just going to go on and they're going to go, his list is fucking sick and they're going to copy it. And I used to run a monthly tournament circuit where every single month I'd do a tournament. And it was staggering to see how rapidly this happens. You know, people would, somebody would win a tournament and then the next month they would be running something different, but somebody else would be running what they won with last month, you know? And then that person would win again and then the whole cycle continues and people were basically just copying the top tier lists. And it's like, well, where's the satisfaction in that? Now you've copied a top tier list. You didn't even write it, you know? Like, where are you? I don't understand where these people are getting that satisfaction from. If it's not from writing the list and therefore it's not from executing any of the plays because you didn't design them, you know, is it just a matter of, like, getting excited at rolling dice and looking at the luck, I guess, maybe? But... The thing about phase locked is it sort of prevents that from being a thing because it, it means that we're incentivizing skill on the tabletop. These are things that you can't copy. You can't write, like if somebody writes a list and they have three phase locked Catan in it, and you're like, okay, well, this is going to be hard. How am I going to deal with these three phase locked Catan? And then when you get on the table, you're going to have to go, okay, I'm going to have to do this in my movement phase so that I can do this in psychic, that in shooting this in my charge, I'm going to need to make sure that I pin them so that in their fight phase I can fight first and take out the rest of those wounds before they get to strike, like you, you've got to come up with all these combos on the fly and execute them like tactically, you know um, and, that, and that's, that's something that you can't, people can't copy that, people can't just look at your list and then copy that so if, if if we pivot to a world where there's more phase locked, right, it actually incentivizes and rewards strategic tactical play as opposed to brute force list building combos. Uh, and I just think that that's something that 40k desperately needs. It's needed for a very long time. And the phase locked is a very elegant way of solving that problem, in my opinion. I think it does a really good job of making it so that you know you you have to come up with a plan on the table like yes you have to make sure that you write things into your list to be able to do this you know and another criticism is that not every army is going to be able to do this like so, you know certain armies like tau they don't really have that much in terms of damage outside of the shooting phase but i think that that's is that's a uh, that's a challenge that GW can solve by just get in the next update go okay cool we're giving every faction one or two things that are phase locked and we're also going to give every faction a way to do damage in every phase you know so it's like cool town might not do damage in the psychic phase right but maybe we give them a command phase ability that does damage, you know, like an orbital bombardment, right? So it's like, okay, cool. Now that's something that you do in your command phase. You can go, cool, I'm dropping a bomb on you. 
and then you in your movement phase you fly your bombers over them and you do some damage in the movement phase and then you've got your shooting phase as well so that's three phases that you can do damage in and you actually can do some damage in combat as well right so there you go you know if you're a corn demons army it's like okay well cool let's give them all fucking fire breath you know so that they do some damage there you know let's give them uh, maybe give them some ability to do damage in the movement phase as well. I really like movement phase damage mechanics. I think that's a really cool trick. Just little things like if, if it moves within three inches, it can do some mortal wounds to it or something like that. Just to represent that, you know, they do... Or, or another good one is uh, the blood crushers. They have a stratagem where they can do damage in the charge phase. So before the fight phase, they charge in and they do, do D3 plus three mortal wounds. So it's like, well, that's really good, because now you can go, cool, I'm going to move forward, I'm going to shoot Abaddon with something, or Gazkal, or fucking, you know, whoever, and then I'm going to charge him, and in the charge phase, I'm going to do mortal wounds to him, and then I'm going to fight him and do mortal wounds to him. That's really cool. Um, and the other thing that it does is it also means that units aren't just... The, one of the problems with 40k at the moment is that it's very much a trading game, right? Is you move your unit up and kill something, and then they drop something on you or they move something out to kill your unit and they kill it and then you move something out to kill their unit and you basically just go and tit for tat trading back and forth and that's not very rewarding in my opinion what i would much rather see is a game where it's like okay i throw my unit out there and damage you then you damage me and then i finish you off you know and the phase cap facilitates that to an extent because if you go into a katan and you only do you know, three wounds to it instead of four and you're not able to, you know, get through that cap or whatever the fuck it is. Like, I think they have a three wound cap. So if you go in and you only do two wounds to it in the psychic phase, like you smite it and you do two wounds, you're like, fuck, that's not enough to break it into that next sort of bracket. That doesn't get it through a phase entirely. So that means you're going to take you an entire another phase to do it, which means that that katan's likely to live. And this is one of the reasons that people hate it but I actually think this is one of the main strengths of the phase cap because it means that you have to then continue to engage with that katan. And if, if the unit that you threw into it is also phase capped, you'll consider the katan player is going to have that same challenge. And basically you're going to end up in a situation where units don't just die and units don't just kill things. They actually scrap and they actually go tit for tat across multiple turns. And that's really rewarding when you have those ongoing combats that are really like a slog and it looks like an epic duel between two units, you know, like it, whether it be two characters or whether it be, you know, units themselves. I don't know how they would do it with units. Maybe this unit can't lose more than three models per phase or something like that. And that way it's sort of, you know, it allows you to throw my, if those two units charge each other, you're going to take turns of removing three models from each other, those sorts of things. Um, I guess one of the other criticisms is that it does sort of blunt a lot of the spikes, right? So, for example, there's a lot of things that do massive amounts of damage, and this having a, a phase cap means that those things effectively get neutered, whereas the things that do fuck all damage, they're not affected by the cap, so therefore it makes small arms fire much more effective and much more relevant because they don't get affected by these caps. But I also think that that's a good thing, because I think there's too many things where it's like, this one unit has the capacity to do 50 wounds to a knight, and it's like, that's too much, you know? Like, the damage ceiling on 40k and 40k is way too fucking high. You know, the amount of damage that certain armies can do in the psychic phase is insane, you know? So, do you really want them to be able to do that much fucking damage, or do you want to put some more phase lock stuff in so that that the top end of the ridiculous combos that people can come up with is is cut down you know it's brought back down to reality the phase cap brings everything that's crazy and over the top and it brings it back down to reality and it makes for a much more engaging game as opposed to just going cool it's my psychic phase i'm gonna do like 30 plus model wounds and just kill like all of your shit and it's like that was lame. Whereas if, if, if there was something where, you know, units could only lose, you know, three or four models per phase, you'd be like, cool, well now, instead of doing fucking 30 plus model wounds in the psychic phase, people are going to be incentivized to move forward, do some damage in the movement phase, kill a couple, 
then do some shooting, then do some psychic, then do some combat, then, you know, maybe do some models in the charge phase or whatever have you. Like, every faction should have their own way to do damage outside of their particular phase. And then you actually get a fucking engaging game where there's stuff happening all over the place instead of just like, oh, I move my tower army out and I shoot you and you die. It's like, that's fucking boring. Whereas if they're like, okay, I move my tower army out, I drop an orbital bombardment over there in the command phase, that kills a few models from that unit, then I use a plucker. It's almost like a coordinated strike, you know? Like, you're like, then I'm using this unit to do this other thing. You know, there might be some bombers that do some things in the movement phase. And then I'm going to shoot you. And then Farsight's going to go in with his sword or the guy who has the Onager gauntlet, he's going to go in and he's going to do some damage as well. And you end up with this really interesting, complex game of moving parts that really does reward strategy. So, yeah, that's my, that's my thoughts on phase-locked units in 40k. I would love to see every single faction have multiple phase-locked. I'd like to see almost all characters be phase-locked you know, or maybe, you know, named characters get phase-locked. And it doesn't necessarily have to be like, so Abaddon's phase-lock is basically a third of his damage, right? So he's got, he's got six wounds. Uh, he's got nine wounds, sorry, and he can only take three per phase. So it takes three full phases of damage to kill him. Phase-lock doesn't necessarily have to be that much, right? You could just go half, right? So you could go, cool, my Chaos Lord, he's got six wounds, but he can only take three per phase. So it's like, okay, so at the very least, it's going to take your opponent two phases to kill him. And anyone who complains about that is fucking weak, because it shouldn't be hard to deal with something in two phases, right? You move up, you shoot him, you charge him, he's dead, you know? You move up, you shoot the... You shoot him, you psychic him, he's dead, you know? It's not hard. So... You know, maybe, maybe, you know, a bunch of characters that have heart phase lock to half. Um, and then you can even do interesting things like the, the new Bloodthirster. He's basically he's phase locked at eight wounds, but he has 20. So it takes three phases to kill him, but not three full phases, you know, because you can do eight, eight, and then four. Or like what happened in my recent battle report against the Grey Knights, they did four wounds to him in the first turn with shooting. And then I charged in and they did eight wounds in combat and then eight wounds in the subsequent combat and killed him, you know. So four, eight, and eight, that's perfect numbers to kill him. So it doesn't necessarily have to be the standard 30%, 33%. Um, hell, you could even make some characters that are more than that. You could make them four wounds, but make them really, like, you know, in, you could just do lots of interesting stuff, I guess, is my overall point. Interesting stuff with it, like... Uh, and then you can just, all you have to do is points cost things and balance them effectively based on that. But I'd be liking to see a bunch of characters, and then I'd also like to see a bunch of units with it as well. And I think this is infinitely better than, say, Neg 1 damage, right? Because Neg 1 damage makes certain, you know, things completely useless, certain weapons. And it's like, you shouldn't be making specific weapon profiles useless. Those should be still useful, but then you have to combo them with stuff in order to get the job done. So I'd like to see less of the Neg 1 damage stuff and more in the phase locked stuff. But uh, yeah, I've still got plenty to say, but I've just arrived at work, so I'm going to leave it there. Uh, I would love to continue this conversation in the comments below. So if you have any thoughts, I would absolutely love to hear them. Chuck them in the comments. Uh, make sure to like and subscribe. And if you are feeling particularly generous and you want to support this channel and help it continue to grow, then head over to my Patreon. And I really appreciate everybody that goes over there and signs up. That's um, very much appreciated on every account. And uh, yeah, I'll talk to you guys in the next one. See ya. Alrighty, guys, I hope you enjoyed that episode as much as I did. And please feel free to like, subscribe, comment, hit the notifications bell, all that good shit. I love the comments and the, I love the conversations that we have in the comments section below. So. Keep that up, I love your work. Uh, and also, if you wanna support the channel a little bit further, please consider heading over to our Patreon. You can sign up for only a dollar a month and that's gonna allow me to buy better lighting equipment, better microphones, better cameras, better equipment all around. It's gonna help me soundproof this room so that we get a better audio quality. You don't hear the cats fighting outside the door, which seems to interrupt more often than I would like. Um, and it's also gonna allow me to potentially reduce my full-time workload so that I can produce these videos on a more regular basis. So I'll be able to hit you with more content that's better.
and all I need is your support on Patreon to do that. So head over there, I'll chuck a link in the description below and I'll see you guys in the next one. Cheers. Walk for the Blood God. Do your objective markers ever get lost behind terrain or other models and become difficult to see? Do they ever get bumped and accidentally moved during a game? And do they ever spark arguments about distances? Well, not anymore. Introducing the blog for the blood god, not even remotely patented, neoprene objective markers. Made from the same material as astronaut suits, or maybe military equipment, or probably neither of those things, this two millimeter thick neoprene synthetic rubber is tear resistant, water resistant, and is designed to last. But that's not all, the blog for the blood god, not even remotely patented neoprene objective markers come in a variety of different designs and styles to suit any faction represented in the Warhammer 40,000 universe. These objective markers are a perfect gift for yourself or a friend and are a perfect way to flex and show your opponent that not only are you a smarter, cooler and better 40k player than them, but you also have more disposable income than they do. For the low price of $25, you'll get not one, not two, but six neoprene objective markers perfectly designed for 9th edition Warhammer 40k. But wait, there's more. For a limited time only, people who sign up on Patreon to support Blog for the Blood God as a Skull Champion tier $5 per month member will gain access to a custom design service where I will design a unique logo to support their gaming club like the one I did to the left here for the Potato Farmers local gaming club here in Melbourne. Follow the links in the description of this video to pick up your set today.